Broadcasting from high above Madison in the State Journal Tower, this is Scott Milford and Phil Hands with Center Stage. You know, Scott, this actually is a closet off Fish Hatchery Road where we're broadcasting from. That's right, but we can dream, can't we? We can dream. Wouldn't it be great to still have a newsroom downtown? Oh, I would love that. Uh, instead, we're over here by the Beltline and... We never see anybody. We have to go downtown to see people. We do. We do. Well, um, welcome back to Center Stage with Milford and Hands, our weekly political podcast. We are half of the Wisconsin State Journal editorial board. The better looking half. Thanks for joining us again. You can find this podcast on go.madison.com slash center stage or on iTunes, SoundCloud, and soon... Google Play, and Stitcher. We are taking the podcasting world by storm. Indeed. Today we're going to talk about the most important issue in Madison history. I'm being sarcastic, but it feels that way. Yeah, it feels that way. The Confederate monument out at Forest Hill Cemetery on Madison's west side. Near west side. Near west side. I defer to you because you are a near west sider. I am. I am. The city council decided last night to remove this monument. I mean, calling it a monument is a bit of a stretch. It's about a four-foot high... Piece of granite. Yeah, and it has the names of about 140 Confederate soldiers who died at Camp Randall as prisoners of war during the Civil War. Yep. There were more than 1,000 Confederate soldiers captured by the Union Army on an island in the Mississippi River south of uh, Wisconsin, and they were brought to Camp Randall, which at that time did not host the Badger football team. No, it was, an, it was a military in, installment, and encampment. Indeed, and these soldiers came in in very rough shape. They had been trying to hold that island, is my understanding from reading some of the history of it. Wounded and sick and injured and not in great health. And uh, they weren't in Madison that long. 140 of them died. They are buried at Forest Hill Cemetery and... This is actually really cool history. This is the farthest north Confederate cemetery in the United States. So this is, it's kind of a a cool little footnote of Madison history that we have this Confederate cemetery, you know, at our public cemetery in Madison. This issue popped up after there was controversy across the nation having to do with Confederate monuments. It was after the the protests in Charlottesville, Virginia. And a lot of us didn't know that we had a Confederate monument in Madison until Mayor Paul Soglin, he decided he was going to remove essentially a plaque that referred to the Confederate soldiers as unsung heroes. Yeah, and the plaque had been installed in 1982 or 81 by a private citizen, and it really didn't have any historical significant value. But in the actual cemetery site, there is this four-foot-tall monument, and it, it was put there by the Daughters of the Confederacy, which is a controversial group. In the early 1900s. In the early 1900s. So this has been here for a long time. Now, what's inter- what I think is really interesting about us bringing the Confederate monuments debate to Madison is that, you know, people have dug in on both sides of this issue, and the Madison monument doesn't really fit into the larger debate because, you know, the the conservatives want to talk about this as being, you know, you're destroying our history, and this is a very valuable part of, of America. Uh, liberals have, have brought up, the I think, the, the valid point that many of these Confederate monuments, statues of Robert E. Lee put in the middle of southern cities or other Confederate heroes, were sort of a symbol to uh, a reconstructing South that that, you know, white people are still in charge and these heroes of the Confederacy are still heroes here. Um, But this monument isn't part of that narrative. No, this is a pretty bland monument. In fact, the Madison Landmarks Commission decided that it did not represent a pro-Confederate view. It was merely marking the names of the soldiers. The names on these individual headstones, you can still make most of them out. But one of the interesting things about the city council's decision last night was to remove this four-foot monument that has, besides having the name of the um, Daughters of the Confederacy on it, it has the names clearly written of the 140-ish soldiers. And by just removing that and not adding anything to the site, I think the names of the soldiers are eventually going to be unreadable. 
the focus became initially on the plaque, the small plaque that Mayor Soglin ordered removed, and most people didn't have a problem with that. It was also Mayor Soglin's view. He wanted some kind of informational panel to explain what was going on there and who these people were at the Confederate rest. Similar to, not far from there, there's a larger cemetery of Union soldiers where there's a nice panel, sort of a historical panel that you see at at historic sites, which explains the Union soldiers and some of who they were and how they wound up there and where they fought. And he thought that there should be something like that. What the city council decided last night was to remove the monument and to not put an informational panel of any kind out in front of it. The vote on removing the monument uh, was unanimous, although a couple alders were gone. The vote to include a informational panel was 13 to 5. Against having the panel. Against having a panel. So we're, so the direction we are heading here is we will have the Confederate rest at the cemetery without any explanation and with tombstones for these soldiers that are going to continue to wear down and we won't be able to read their names. I think not having a some sort of historical marker explanation, explanatory panel is really the, the, the thing I disagree with the most here. Whether the monument stays or goes, I don't really care that much. I mean, it's, it's, I don't find it that offensive. I, the only thing about the monument that I found particularly offensive was that it's actually placed on top of people's graves. <laughs> I mean, it's sitting there in the middle of this tombstone, and you can't even see two or three headstones because it's right in front of them, which is a really odd placement for this marker. Y- yeah, our our editorials were kind of the only voice making that point for some reason. Well, Nobody seemed to care about we it. We actually went to the cemetery. We took an yeah. editorial board field trip to the cemetery <laughs> to look at this, which I don't think anybody else has ever done, because the way people talk about this issue... You know, nobody seems to understand what it is or how it looks or what the context is, which is a problem. Um, And I think a mark, some sort of display sign explaining what this is, is really what's needed more than anything else. It could explain who these soldiers were, how they died in Wisconsin, and how needed. I mean, I think it's just sort of interesting that we have this cemetery in Wisconsin. Yeah, I think it was unfortunate that the city council essentially decided to ignore the history here. I understand some of them thought that putting up some kind of explanation would either be very, A, difficult for Madison to do, to put it in context. Well, that's true. Yeah, and not inject a bunch of today's politics into it. Do you think that was a concern of theirs, Scott, really? <laughs> well, they, that was a spoken concern, uh, a stated concern. I think the real concern, which was stated with more emotion, was that they felt that any sort of recognition of of Confederate soldiers was offensive given the, the given the reality of slavery and how harsh that was. Yeah, slavery sucked. Yeah, but interestingly, Alder Barbara McKinney, who is one of a couple uh, African American members of the city council, she very emotionally and eloquently argued for not having a marker. She said a lot of these slaves that died didn't have a marker. On the other hand, I thought Alder Paul Skidmore made a really good point, which he, which he said, you know, people around here forget that we Northerners essentially did the same thing to American Indians. The Union Army essentially hunted down and killed American Indians. He had argued that some kind of explanation made sense. I think some sort of explanation makes a lot of sense. And I think there's even an opportunity in the contextualized information to explain um, some of the ambiguous history of Confederate monuments, you know, and and that a lot of them were actually put up 50 years after the Civil War, not to not to commemorate, you know, the war as much as as a as a symbol of uh, a Jim Crow South, you know, and I think I think that's part of this whole interesting history that if we just remove it, we don't learn from it. And I think that's kind of a shame. Yeah. One good thing, I think, that comes out of this is William Green, the Confederate soldier whose tombstone was just inches behind this big monument and could not be seen. We will now be able to see 
his tombstone. And maybe he'll be able to rest in peace without having that giant monument on top of his grave. Yeah, the way it was set down in there was really odd. Now, maybe it's possible that it was set down in there before these tombstones were laid out, but I I find that hard to believe because nobody would put someone's headstone directly behind a giant monument where nobody could read it. Yeah. So by moving this monument, I think it was poorly placed to begin with. I just wish, like you do, that A, we could read the names of these soldiers, and B, there would be some kind of historical context. We could have bypassed Madison politics and just had a a neutral historian do something short and sweet, kind of like what they did for the Union soldiers not far away. I mean, it's an interesting part of Wisconsin history. And I, I think get it, I think not acknowledging that doesn't do anybody any favors. No, and in fact, if you haven't been to Forest Hill Cemetery when they do some of these reenactments, it's really cool. I've been out there to one of them where they'll have an actor uh, from Madison dress up and play the role of someone who died there, and the actor will stand right in front of the tombstone of that person and tell you about his or her life. And when I was out there once, there was a guy who was being one of the Confederate soldiers and describing his capture and how he was brought to Madison and how he died in Madison. It's, it is a really interesting part of our history. And there's some question about how well they were treated. I think there are references in newspaper articles in the State Journal at the time that some citizens in Madison brought them food and were kind to them and that some of them were congratulatory to us when they left and thanked us for treating them well. I think there's some other information suggesting otherwise. Um, well, one in ten of, about one in 10 of the soldiers who was in Camp Randall died. Um, so that doesn't sound great, but maybe, our, maybe we're adding our modern views of health and treatment onto uh, uh, an older time. Yeah, I can't imagine being in a prison camp during the Civil War would be anything approaching to pleasant or nice. No. I mean, nothing about the war was pleasant or nice. Probably even if you were the commander, you were in bad situations, if you were Grant or somebody. So what's the takeaway on this? Well, one of the things that I find really interesting about this whole issue was how much misinformation spread. We got a ton of letters to the editor about this topic, and I, I, I cannot describe, I can't, I, can't, I can't count the number of times we've had people say, you know, we shouldn't be digging up these graves. We should let these <laughs> soldiers rest in peace. Nobody in Madison was talking about actually removing these graves, digging up bones, removing headstones of soldiers. The only person that was talking about doing that was some guy who was part of the Sons of the Confederacy who wanted to remove the graves, the, st- the, the bones out of Madison to protect them for posterity so they weren't going to be vandalized by Madisonians, which was never going to happen. But we had a ton of letters to the editor saying, don't remove these graves, don't disturb these dead bodies, which nobody was going to do. And I don't know how that misinformation got spread so far and so fast. I also think we, I heard from readers who were were learning about this, and they were down south, and they seemed to imagine that this was some sort of elaborate monument, that the word monument meant that there was, you know, a, a statue of Robert E. Lee or some big giant, you know, tomb or something. And in reality, all it was was this four-foot piece of concrete that was not very uh, showy or hard to really even spot. Yeah. I also will say that we did not get a lot of letters saying, you know what, it's time for this monument to go. We need to whitewash this part of our history. This is a bad thing to have in Madison. Most people said, you know what, leave it here. History is important for for our community. And I think the city council maybe, not that our letter writers are the people who should be speaking for the city council, but their, their perception of what was going on did not gel with what my perception was of letter writers in Madison. And our letter writers are not a very conservative group of people. I think going forward, I would not be surprised if some sort of informational sign or plaque eventually winds up there. Any city council in the future could decide to put something up there, even though it's not going to happen now. I mean, putting if, if this marker, if this, if this monument ends up in a Wisconsin Historical Museum or the Veterans Museum, that's fine. If, 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 and as long as there's some sort of historical marker at the site that explains why we have 140 you know, dead Confederate soldiers sitting in our, in our graveyard, because right now there's nothing to tell you why that exists. Yeah, basically I think the city council kind of got this half right. They, they removed the offensive plaque that was from the 80s from the front, 
they moved this larger monument. I don't think I would have removed it from the site entirely, but I think it was oddly placed. But then what they got wrong uh, was not including some kind of information for passersby or, or people looking for it. Yeah, I think adding more information is always the solution to dealing with these difficult issues. One final thought I had on this was how much people care about this. You know, it's just a couple of slabs of concrete that are pretty small in a cemetery that most people don't go to, yet the Civil War still holds such power in our minds and, and 150 years later in society and who we think we are and who we think we've become. I think you're right about that. There's something about these markers that get tied up with the issues of slavery, which I think this country still faces, deals with on a regular basis. You know, we still haven't washed our hands of the sins of slavery entirely. And, uh, you know, the Civil War, I still, despite the fact that it was over 150 years ago, some of those issues are still cropping up again and again. And it's a sensitive topic in Madison because as much as, as Madison thinks that it bends over backwards to help people of all shapes, sizes, creeds, races, and ethnicities, Madison has really been staring itself in the mirror lately because we have such high disparities when it comes to locking up black men in particular in our jail and, and as a state in our prisons, and also that Madison doesn't graduate enough of its Madison students. Now, it was actually below 50 percent a handful of years ago of black students were graduating from Madison schools, which is horrendous. Now, there's been progress on that, and, and it's now improved. But I think that's part of what is going on here, too, is that Madison wants to show that it cares about this issue, that it's going to do the right thing, especially in light of some of its failures. I'm not entirely sure this is the best way to address those issues, <laughs> but it's the no, Madison it's way not. to address these issues. Yeah. Well, if you have an opinion on the uh, Forest Hill Cemetery and the Confederate Rest, by all means, send it in to us, and we appreciate you listening to this podcast. I do need to make one correction from our podcast because last week. I will say, when we get something wrong... Unlike the president, we correct it. <laughs> and uh, what I got wrong was we were talking about special elections this summer for the Assembly and Senate for the legislature. And I had mentioned that George Farrader might be a good candidate to run in the 42nd Assembly District, which is a Columbia County seat that just ducks down a little bit into Dane County. And I had mentioned him as the uh, mayor of Doylesville. It turns out he's actually was the village president of Doylestown, and he is now a village trustee. He is no longer the president. And one final correction I need to make is, is near the end of that podcast, I referred to a orange-haired man in the White House, and I think, Phil, you as a cartoonist who colorized the president every week in your cartoons. He doesn't have orange hair. He's an orange man, right? Yeah, it's the, it's the hair. The hair is more yellowish. That's the skin that's so orange. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I did want to correct that also. I think that's important. Setting the record straight is very important. We'll talk again next week. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.